And we are live, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, geeks and book and sci-fi and comic fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes. Welcome to another Geek Book Club, the club where geeks books read. And uh, we, I, I'm joined, as always, I, of course, am Juan Carlos Bagnell, at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Internet. Uh, of course, joined uh, by my lovely and talented co-host, Mr. Andrew Wallace, at Fat Produce on Twitter. How's it going this evening? Greetings. Good. It's going pretty good. Just, uh, boy, I'm just ape all, all I've got aliens on the mind right now. <laughs> on the mind. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you've got, it sounds like you've got a bad case of Sofons messing up your mics. Yes. So. Yes, it does. There, I have the trisolarans are actively, actively sabotaging my, my internet, all of my computer equipment. So trying, trying to take us down, it, trying to halt that progress. Yeah. For some reason, this Sofon's name Murphy. I don't know. You don't really know why, you know, but <laughs> Murphy oh well. the Sofon is, yeah. Is <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So yeah. All right. It's, well, I, I, I'm just giving the heads up because Google Hangouts seems to be infected by trisolarans. And uh, if we have any wackiness, it took us a couple extra minutes to get, get our stream started tonight. But again, I know I've got good stuff to record audio and video, and I know you've got good stuff to record audio and video. So I kind of feel like it's Google's fault. <laughs> Blaming well, you know. Google. <laughs> Yeah, it's no worry. We we don't worry. We got it covered. We got it covered. We got a great show for you guys tonight. <laughs> so yeah, it's, no, uh, this one we're actually both really lit up about. Um, again, into our second year uh, of book reviews and book commentary, revisiting a series that uh, took us by took me by surprise. It was is a book that I absolutely adored. And uh, it's part of a trilogy. And so now we're going to read book two. I, I guess in 2019, we'll read book three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the pattern. Uh, but no, we, we are revisiting the world of the three body problem. Uh, this time now, chapter two of this, uh, of this uh, trilogy is The Dark Forest. Mm -hmm. Dark mm. Forest. That's the name of the book. Yep. So, ha, ha, do you know how to pronounce this author's name? Is it Sizen? Uh, you know, I heard the only time I've heard it pronounced was at the beginning of the audiobook, and then I immediately forgot. And then just, it was just terrible. I'm a, I'm horrible. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm, I'm he's a bad. very talented writer. <laughs> no, a phenomenal writer. I like. It, it, this is this is science fiction from a wholly unique perspective. If you mm -hmm. grew up in a more sort of Western uh, influence, I, I, obviously we did a whole podcast on the first book, the Three Body Problem. Uh, so you know, just go ahead and pause us now and go and listen to that two hours of discussion that we had before we jump into this. But I, I think what we're treated to here is a wonderful stretch of of not necessarily time travel, but of human future philosophy of humanity coming together to face a, a stronger opposition, a stronger foe, and then playing with the conventions of time from a very Eastern perspective. Again, like what was so charming about the three, three body problem was taking some tropey science fiction material that I think we've seen beaten to death from a Western perspective and giving it the fresh spin of a Chinese author tackling the same kind of concepts. And, and that I still think holds true for book two of this series. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's very interesting too, to think about how with most science fiction series that we get, like, this takes this is on a much grander scale with than than I was expecting with uh, how society itself, the very fabric of society changes and and an ideology completely upends its you know is upended. Yeah. It's and just the fact that it's it's the narrative takes a very long road, a very long uh, time span, like a, a long term approach towards the problem that they're facing that which is very, very refreshing from what I've traditionally read with with science fiction novels especially space science you know so, you know pure yeah, space, hard space science, space fiction. science fiction definitely yeah. so I, I mean i feel like the first book flipped the conventions of a first contact story on its head mm -hmm. the second book to me it feels like if we were to mix a ray bradbury or an isaac asimov you know some 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 mm -hmm. like old school early science fiction authors 
if we were to take their kind of scope and then infuse it with some shots of Eastern philosophy, that that's what we arrive at with the dark forest. So you could, you could look at a series of books like the foundation series from uh, Isaac Asimov talking about, uh, you know, I forget Harry Seldon comes up with a mathematical formula for predicting um, you know, uh, large numbers of people like you you could you could sort of come up with trends um, in this future science. You could then predict those trends. Um, what what we see with the dark force isn't necessarily that it's not it's not an exact uh, parallel to that, but it does seem to be cut from a very similar cloth. We've got a problem in the here and now. Um, we're facing a challenge that's going to arrive in hundreds of years and we know it's coming so what can we do to anticipate future challenges and try and build off of that work to face this challenge that's that's coming to us that that to me just feels like such an asimov's logic problem or such a mm -hmm. a, a bradbury you know philosophical problem or even in an arthur c clark you know the whole like uh, you know arthur c clark wrote so much this aspirational the evolution of humanity in 2001 mm -hmm. and in childhood end um dark forest very aggressively in the first half of this novel tapped me back into those books that i loved or those book series that i love foundation is like 12 novels now um but that you 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 invest in that time to get a payoff far in the future even even when you know, you're a fan reading books like you look 12 books ahead you know that's a payoff far in the future of where you're reading right now mm -hmm. well and, and initially with the the concept of this book so so essentially the trisolarans which are the the antagonistic alien force that's coming towards earth ha they're going to get here they're going to arrive in 400 years so they so earth has a time limit with this and it's and i was so with this time limit in mind i did not expect to be i, I okay i rather than i it was more of a uh, i just was unsure about i didn't think that it would go that quickly through time and space <laughs> i guess is the best way to put but, it I, the passage of time was just uh, i did not <laughs> expect they could do that in three books you know with that, that amount of you know but well, no, so, I, mean, I, I think it's I think it's <laughs> worth sort of just taking a pause and kind of recapping briefly what I mean, yeah, let's yeah, recap really. very briefly what <laughs> took us two hours to discuss the first time we <laughs> talked about a book in the series. Uh, so the three body problem is an amazing achievement in science fiction storytelling, not just for how novel the uh, the storytelling is, again, coming from an Eastern author, but that the translation is so <laughs> beautiful. And that's definitely something I think we need to dig into because the the first book, the Three Body Problem, I've already forgotten his name, and the book's covered, and now I can't see who did the translation on the Three oh. Body Problem. I got you covered. I got you covered. Um, yeah, like it. Well, it is a I very distinct difference. Those. It's uh, Luke. Da oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Here, let me pull it up. Because I can't remember this is terrible podcasting <laughs> but yeah it's it's it was it was very there was that you could there were very different styles and how like these books felt very ken, different ken lu ken lu ken, okay ken lu okay yes ken, ken ken lu is an incredible uh science fiction author in his own right bringing elements of uh eastern perspective into short science fiction stories that just absolutely punch me in the gut emotionally every time I sit down to read. It's like it, it, it's like reading his short stories is is akin to watching Black Mirror. Like I can't mm -hmm. I can't just binge. I need I need recovery time in between <laughs> each one of his stories. I need to like take a step away. Um now Dark Forest has a different translator and like I said we're going to we're going to touch on that. But the three body problem tells the story of Earth's first contact with an alien species approximately four and a half light years away from us, and that they are trying to reach out and communicate with humanity because they are it, early in the book, the three body problem, they're trying to solve this three body problem. It, it's a planet that is surrounded by three different suns. And because of the gravitational forces there, this is actually something you can look up. It's a, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, um, a trick of physics that this is a completely unpredictable 
chaotic relationship this these three stars orbiting um or this planet that orbits three small stars and so <laughs> the trisolar trisolarans trisolar trisolarans um D discover that there's a life-sustaining planet in our solar system and it's four and a half light years away and what ensues is communication back and forth between uh, trisolarans and a faction of humanity that is starting to treat these aliens as if they were gods they become this sort of mm -hmm. death cult and they try and empower the trisolarans to um to come here and basically wipe us out um that they're more they're going to be more deserving of a stable environment than we are so right. the, the the book ends with the trisolarans on their way knowing that it's going to take hundreds of years for them to finally arrive here and at the same time the trisolarans have manipulated uh what happens here on earth so that our ability to progress to uh to improve in the fields of physics and research and science has been halted so there's there's a brick wall that we're going to approach in terms of improving our technology. And we know that aliens are on their way to basically wipe us out and take over our planet. And that's where three body problem ends. And as she introduces us into the political ramifications of this knowledge, what we're going to do about it. And then time starts very fluidly being manipulated by the author in this book, too, as we traverse a very grand a very broad swath of human future history. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is probably the most grand and the most grand scale science fiction novel that I've ever read, really. Uh, and it's and it's refreshing how how comprehensive it is, but it's also interesting how the book changes genres. Uh, it changes <laughs> genres several times, uh, which which I liked. I think the beginning, uh, I, I really did like the kind of spy intrigue that you that you had. Mm -hmm. Where so so we should probably introduce some of the characters, and I'm gonna be I am horrendous yeah, at, like, at, at I, remembering I think, these characters' names. I I I'm it's always gonna be the terrible running joke of our podcast is. I am a dumb American and I will have <laughs> no concept of properly pronouncing people's names from outside of this chunk of the planet. And so <laughs> yeah. just, just assume I'm going to offend tons of people who may or may not ever hear this. Well, and they, they so like we learn early on in the book that uh, that between and then uh, you know talk between a Sophon and and a human from that faction about how well, they been joking about that too. We should probably even just pause there to explain Sophons and like what, yeah. that, what that is is, <laughs> is like a joke. Yeah. So, oh man, do you remember the uh, the creation of the yeah. Sophons? Uh, yeah. So so. The cre I've forgotten the creation side of them, side of them, like because they're they're folded up into the subatomic level, aren't they? Like because they're mm -hmm. they're pretty much, uh, yeah, they're subatomic entities. That uh, how they fold all that down, I'm kind of a little bit m messy on because it's been a year since I've read that. So, but so uh, it's a particle which has been folded against itself down through extra dimensions. So not, oh. not like the fourth dimension is time, but like, you know, if you've ever uh, if you've ever seen like Carl Sagan talk about different dimensions, that's kind of what we're talking about. OK, Trisolarans discover that they can fold a particle, one one piece of material, one literally one atom of material and fold it against itself, pulling it deeper through different dimensions and that they can actually imbue that with um sort of a functional intelligence this is this is some of the magic of the three yeah. bodies, right science fiction always has its own flavor of magic so fonds become the magic of this storytelling and sort of the philosophical even they touch on different religious aspects of the mm -hmm. trisolarans but they've discovered yeah. that by pulling this this particle through different dimensions they can't travel interstellar distances um instantaneously but their so fonds can cover intra-dimensionally or extra-dimensionally right. i forget exactly how they phrased it but essentially while they're this the trisolaran fleet is going to take hundreds of years to reach earth they can send these particles these sophons and they can monitor through the sophon so it's like a real-time camera feed it's kind of like subspace in star trek 
You know, like yeah, you can have a real much. time video conversation with someone on the other side of the galaxy. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's really interesting because they 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 send them and they interfere with their, yeah, like you're saying, like interfere with the particle accelerator accelerators. So it's nice how this book shows how over this space of time we get to see how we develop technologically everywhere except for that you know the sum you know with quantum mechanics and it, it's it's very interesting seeing the choices that characters have to make that that basically determine the path of humanity through a space of two 200 years at this book mm -hmm. basis so it's it's really interesting well so starting out we we realize now that with a discussion with uh, the Sophon, how the Trisolarans cannot, like the, their thoughts are instantly communicated. So they can, they, they cannot hide. They don't have any concept of lying or deceit. And that's what terrifies them of, you know, of humanity. And it's really interesting because they ended up, calling to bringing everyone together and they have what are called wall facers who the idea is they have their own plan set up that only they know until the actual battle is going to hit which yeah, we get some more cryogenic four, four people yeah so, four. so this 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 project is if the trisolarans can monitor everything we say everything we do and that there is this sort of magical evil eye that they represent. So maybe even the Sophon might not necessarily be able to see everything, but it can traverse interstellar distances in the blink of an eye. It can be anywhere on the planet at any time. And it, it can send this direct feed back to the Trisolarans to report on what's going on. So Earth's government, under the purview of the United Nations, decides that the one thing that they can't anticipate is a plan that is perfectly contained in one person's mind. So they they draft four people that they think are going to be exceptional uh, tacticians and uh, interesting individuals that will be able to think outside the box, keep their plans to themselves roughly enough to, to hide uh, specific aspects of the plan from the Trisolarans and then operate with basically an unlimited budget, total impunity. They're kind of above the law when this project mm -hmm. starts. And so this freaks out the Trisolarans and they create sort of counterpoints. So the wall facers mm -hmm. um, are the people that are going to come up with, potentially, hopefully come up with the plan to save humanity. The Trisolarans task the religious cultists that, that, worship the trisolarans they, they task mm -hmm. those humans with coming up with the wall breaker project and the first mm -hmm. half of the book focuses significantly on this dynamic and, and i really felt like we were going to be in for a great slow burn spy versus spy right. thriller kind of story um which isn't what we get at all <laughs> no yeah no i was that's that that's what threw me off so much as i was going getting through this book where it just changed shifts tone just as incredibly quickly but it it, well, it was no i i, I mean because we were talking about this before we jumped on the show we were trying to pin down roughly where we feel the story just completely pulls the rug out from under you i do feel mm -hmm. like there's it, it's about 45 to 50% of the way into the book where it becomes a very different book. Um, yeah, it, it goes off the rails for me at mind control. <laughs> so right. that's, that's even farther. So, <laughs> Well, and, and I mean, like we, we have, we have some of the, some, some really interesting concepts at play. And again, they are approached from a science fiction perspective, science fiction perspective, but this, this has a a very distinct thread of fantasy mm -hmm. which runs through it i think this this for me before we actually sort of like detail individual plot moments and then maybe get into spoiler territory i think this is where i had some difficulties with this book in the translation from mm -hmm. moving moving from uh from ken lu in the three body problem to joel martinson jo joel martinson had had some big shoes to fill yes after having read ken lu's writing and i feel joel martinson's approach to this translation is is just more practical whereas ken lu really tries to bring a western reader along for the ride of the perspective 
of Eastern philosophy. There were so many more um, annotations and footnotes and ex uh, explanatory portions of Ken Liu's translation that I feel that did a better job of delivering the emotional stakes. You know, that that, that surrounding mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. helps tremendously in informing why a matter of honor would be important or why losing face in a situation would have been critical to these individuals, to these players, to these government officials, to these scientists. And I feel like Joel Martinson's approach to the dark forest was far more practical. So I felt mm -hmm. like the depictions of some of the discussion on tactics, on military strategy and on science were totally on point. I felt this book lacked just a little of the cohesive fibers of emotion, you know, well, that, that I, I yes, felt like agreed. that was so satisfying from the first book. I felt like that was a little underplayed here. Well, and I, I get the feeling that if you taken these two translators and had them sit down and translate the book, writing it down, you know, into English, that the 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 uh, the translator for Three Body would translate it and and have it transcribed in cursive versus print <laughs> for the next one is a good analogy I kind of feel like. Well, Joel Martinson would have had that great like architectural analytical yeah. everything's a capital letter and just some capital yes. letters are bigger and smaller than other capital letters. No, I, I'm totally with you there. there there's uh, let me see if I still have it bookmarked. Uh there there was one one specific passage very early in the book when it became shockingly clear that I was in for a completely different um, experience than uh, than what the first book had to offer. And oh, man. I think I, I, I tagged it, but did, I, I might not have. Did your translation have the footnotes uh, like the three body did, uh, cultural footnotes? No, it didn't. Okay, so that's one thing. So, because I remember whenever I read, whenever we did Three Body, I listened to the audiobook, mm -hmm. um, and and I did the same thing with this because uh, I wanted to kind of also just kind of see the difference in the. It was a, also a different, uh, different narrator, and it definitely felt more wooden. It was very. It kind of this. I would definitely recommend reading this series. Don't. Uh, don't. It's. It's tempting to do the audiobook with this but it, i feel like i lost a lot of the emotion well the, the audiobook the, the audiobook faces a very unique challenge um we're already dealing with one step removed from the original source mm -hmm. by having it translated into english and like it or not someone reading the book to you is making decisions is making is translating emotions and is uh, is deciding for your brain what's going to be important and what's not, even with the best of intentions, even mm -hmm. with the, 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 the sort of approval of the author, it's, it's not as pure. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it's, it's a little, it's a little, um, th there is some handholding in even just the emphasis on which words might be placed that your brain might have arrived at a different importance or a different conclusion. So this feel like to me, I, the audiobook would be problematic in that it would be an additional step away from the original source material that I'm not used to. Uh, I'm not used to consuming my literature that way. Right. Yeah. And it's, um, I guess one character I'd like to talk about a little bit is uh, Yin Wen Xie. I believe that's how you pronounce it. He's the astrophysicist. Well, went from being an astrophysicist and then became a professor of sociology. <laughs> Hopefully cosmic like sociology. Him. Yeah, I mean, it's the natural thing to break into, you know? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's he is one of the wall facers who... But, it, one of the four wall facers and it's uh, his character this author is really great at making characters who kind of are jerks yeah, uh totally yeah like his, like like his the, first the jerkier the character he writes the more likable they become right and well in this case okay this was really interesting because like I, I remember uh early on in the book where he had his idea like he, so he was dating this writer and and he made he she encouraged him to make a character because she uh, thought he'd be great at you know writing stories, and he proceeds to have a psychotic break. It seems like <laughs> where he imagines this character in real life, and it basically ruins his life. So, 
<laughs> this is why I really felt we were going to be in for more of a philosophical thriller. Yeah. Because what you just described there sounds like it would just be sort of a, a one or two page funny aside. No. No. Invests uh, like no. a significant chapter of the book to explaining that this professor becomes something of a writer in describing a character to his author girlfriend and then the depths to which his intellectual exercise of creating a female character completely transcends his ability to have a meaningful relationship with women who are alive and that that also radically influences his plan as a this, wall facer right that, well they even give her like they bring not only does he imagine this perfect woman he uses the resources to find this perfect woman who yeah, would statistically so, exist like that that so one, we, just like we, early on this jumped off the rails for me yeah and, and again that this is this is such a big <laughs> chunk of the book but that it <sighs> so early i really figured that that was going to be um a more significant aspect of again a thriller that stayed in its time. Mm -hmm. but we'll explain what that means in just a bit. So the other wall facers are coming up with very, uh, what, what looked to be very conventional military strategies for facing an, an opposing force, which is substantially more technologically advanced. Mm -hmm. And one of the other wall facers does a phenomenal job. I mean, in, in the philosophy of the first half of this book, explaining some of the concepts of military and morale. Um, I really mm -hmm. thought that those passages of the book were extremely successful in talking about uh, s sort of the psychological aspects of warfare, facing a stronger opponent, being outnumbered or outgunned. And then what do you do to try and instill a, a, a sense of camaraderie, a sense of partnership, um, a sense of brotherhood or sisterhood, and not letting defeatism uh, it overly influence decision makings in the military so far. I mean, there's, there's even this one brilliant showdown between a number of generals and one of the wall facers mm -hmm. and a strategist saying, you know, well, I believe that this general has given up hope. Yeah. And the general stands up and says, yeah, I should probably go. <laughs> I know it's, it's, it, I was not expecting. Plus also, this is a character that's been, that was introduced earlier in the book, mm -hmm. you know, as, as, you know, as a very much a, an equal partner to the, to the folk character, the character that was the focus of that chapter. Yeah. And so it, it, it's, it's interesting seeing how they lead through this and have to combat it. Cause it's not only just defeatism. There's the, there are the the group that are just going to give up, you know, and let the Trisolarians kill us. There's also the group that want to escape and go Ballister Galactica style. And I go, you know, to escape from our solar system and they, and they basically couple, and then there's the people who want to stand and fight the, they basically couple both of those ideologies of the people who are defeatists and the escapists together as one, uh, which we, we get to see kind of, yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting and very, very nuanced. <laughs> so this is, I, I because we, we need to start you know, sort of tying some of our, well, hold on, let's pause and let's preface this. Hold on, let's pause yeah. and let's preface that. We, we're, we're getting to a point where we can actually tie those moments into the story. And that's a little bit of what it felt like to me reading this book um, and why I really feel like, I really feel like this, sh this could have been, not that it should have been, but that it could have been two separate books. Mm. I, almost, I almost wish, see, I like, a good, quiet, slow build thriller style story and mm -hmm. everything that we're investing in emotionally in these characters in the first half, the relationships that are created, the different wall facer plans and how some of them sound pants on head silly. One of them turns out to be somewhat traitorous in, in yeah. what would be good for some individual humans and bad for basically all of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and then how all of those threads are interwoven, we're, we're, we're dealing with sort of a very near future. The, the book was originally written in 2008. The translation, I believe, arrived closer to 2014. 
Yeah, I think you're, I believe you're correct. Some, some, on somewhere that. in there. I, I know I'm ballparking it there. Um, so the, the, the book takes place in, in a future very similar, in, in a future very, very close to our timeline today in 2018. Mm -hmm. It could be roughly that, that, that time period. And I really felt like we could have just stayed in this time period, but they introduce the concept of hibernation. So you can be, excuse me, cry cryogenically <laughs> frozen and that you, you can serve as reinforcements for the future. Say you're a really passionate individual, you, you exemplify uh, a human spirit for perseverance. Um, there's the fear that humans of the future might be defeated emotionally before the Trisolarans even arrive. So we could put you on ice and send you to the future with plans and with strategies and with goals to help guide future humans. So mm -hmm. there are these really interesting concepts that I kind of wish had been reserved for a completely different book. I really well, feel like we could have spent the emotional currency. Like we, we, we build up this emotional currency with all of the characters of today's time period. And then we could have just cashed that check in for this story in this time period and had another book, you know, turn this from a trilogy <laughs> into a quartet, uh, a yeah. third book that dealt with the time travel -y ramifications of this this kind of story well i feel like there are two ways that they they could have done this they could have done this the way the way the way you're suggesting and splitting it into a couple of different books or if they were if they wanted to continue to have it just in the one book they i feel like they should have had a little bit more of a paced approach to jump so instead of jumping uh, eight you know 100 years in the future suddenly how about jumping well they did jump like 10 years but you know jump like 20 years and then maybe another 40 years and then another 20 years kind of like it's spreading it out a little bit might have helped i think if they wanted to keep it to one novel maybe i i, I kind of feel like there's there's a beautiful point about halfway through this book where one of our main characters finally is put on ice because of mm -hmm the plan that he's created mm -hmm. we're not going to see the effects of for over a century um so it doesn't make sense for him to just die if we want him to be a valuable strategist and so i think like we could have created i'm, I'm totally armchair quarterbacking here because the book is phenomenal <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to say like, you know, this is a problem. This is like a criticism I often have of like movies, you know, like you should have, you should have taken Ender's game and made it three movies, not just one. Um, but, uh, I feel like there could have been a conclusion to his storyline that would have been completely satisfying, completely built up, completely contained in this time period, in, in the initial time period mm -hmm. and left off as a cliffhanger. Yeah, like that would have been kind of nice. On ice. Because, because again, I, I'm totally cribbing this. I'm. It's not like I'm so creative or anything. I'm totally stealing this from the Foundation stories, uh, Isaac Asimov, mm. where from one book to the next, we could be talking about a difference of hundreds of years of human civilization changing throughout the galaxy. Um, and it's okay because you've told the contained part of that story. Then the next important part happens in 150 years, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, again, that's why I keep... I keep pointing to that as the classic science fiction inspiration for a story like Dark Forest. But there's also something really bold about the fact that basically we start with, if, if we're going to make the comparison, this is such a cheap shot at this book, and it, I don't mean it to sound as snarky as I do, but the first half of this book is 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the <laughs> second half of this book is 2010, 2061, and 3001 all in the same amount of time as the first half of the book. Yeah, they, that that's a big problem I have with... So <laughs> they jump forward 200 years, and I, I, I felt, since we didn't have so much time to develop this... All the most, all the people from 200 years from the future felt two dimensional to me. Mm -hmm. They kind of felt like it felt very analogous to like the uh, the uh, old the you know, old millennial stereotype where it's kind of like the you know the same sort of feelings evoked and they're kind of dehumanized almost a little bit mm -hmm. to a certain extent. They feel less human than the people who are from from the future at least the way that it was translated and the way it felt to me and the way it was presented a little bit and i think they would have benefited by having having a little bit more time to draw out the culture of the of the you know two cent uh, you know as two centuries later essentially so we how did you pronounce his name in uh 
For which character again? The, uh, uh, Luo G. Oh yeah, Luo G. Yeah, Luo G. Um, mm -hmm. So this is this is the astronomer turned sociologist, and very early in the book. Yes, yes, you're right. He he is. I mean, I forget exactly. So you'll have to apologize. I, I have to apologize. I finished this book um, last night, but I read the last third of this book in one sitting. So it's kind of become <laughs> a blur. Some of the different <laughs> aspects oh. that have come to it. But, but, well, but, but basically, the, the main, one of the main female characters from the previous book instills in Luo Ji some notion of um, like, like, a, like an axiom of the universe, a cosmic sociology. Mm -hmm. Rules that could, we, we, that could help us understand the fundamental relationships of cosmological events and objects. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a little bit of the Harry Seldon, you know, futurology science woo <laughs> in that. Right. <laughs> so, so Luo Ji becomes a very critical figure to the Trisolarans because the Trisolarans are so much more advanced than we are that they are already starting to understand and incorporate those axioms into their technology. And that's what they're trying to prevent us from discovering. That's what they're trying to prevent us from doing. So this mm -hmm. first half of the book deals a lot with Luo Ji's emotional journey because it's through his emotional understanding of these axioms that we have, we, we, we as the reader will start to understand some hope for the future of humanity. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the course that we take to get there is very convoluted through his descriptions of creating imaginary fictional women, using the resources of the Wallfacer Project to find a woman that matches and, uh, his fictional description. And then build his dream home to, to escape reality in. Like it, and then the thing that made me so mad about that was that those characters were, in the end, or just her, her character was designed to be a damsel in distress, essentially, and um, and yes. like um, that's it, and they, they well, solely they serve solely as his purpose for them yeah, leveraging him. This, to, don't don't you feel like this is this is one of those elements lacking in Martinson's translation? Is mm -hmm. She was a fictional idea in his mind. She is only a small plot motivator when she's discovered to be a real woman. She's essentially not. She's no more real in the flesh than when she was just a piece of his imagination. And I feel yep. like this is one of those instances where Ken Liu would, I've, I think, would have delivered the emotion of that better. Whereas yeah. Ken... Joel Joel Martinson delivers. Well, we found the lady, and now the next important part of the book is where he works on this project. And <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm not I'm not saying he he's inadequate. What I'm saying is I feel like he just didn't quite grasp that connection of the audience reading this this story and of what Luo Ji would have focused on in his own self mental experimentation and philosophy if that makes sense yeah it's oh man so i, 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 I want to read i want to read this passage because this yeah. this is emblematic of uh joel martinson's writing style how it's practical but it's not romantic and i feel like there's a romantic element missing i, I mean in the sense of a classic romanticism a classic romantic literature so this is this is like because again, I read this on a Kindle, so it's five percent of the way into the book, and this is where I knew I was on a completely different ride than when I was uh, reading the Three Body Problem. In one remote, rem let's try that again. I can do the voiceover. Ready? <laughs> In one remote corner of the vast sea of information on the internet, there was a remote corner, and in a remote corner of that remote corner. And then in a remote corner of a remote corner of a remote corner of that remote corner, that is in the very depths of the most remote remote corner of all, a virtual world came back to life. That is just so inelegant. It's like, like if data translated it. 
No, I feel like Data even would have been like, well, I drew upon the uh, inspirations <laughs> of different kind of types of literature. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so man. It's that, that's so practical. You know, again, what I feel like what little I understand of Chinese language and Chinese storytelling, we could have drawn the parallel to something fractal, to something beautiful, to something in nature, which follows the parts of the whole but becomes its own unique part as you examine it closer, you know, mm -hmm. like a sunflower viewed under a microscope resembles these parts and these pieces. And you can walk down this trailer, you can descend down this path and see pieces that you'd never seen before, but would recognize, you know, th I, th there's just, when you just say, you know, a tiny piece of a tiny piece of a tiny piece of a tiny piece. And that is to say, it's the tiniest piece of a tiny piece of a tiny piece <laughs> does not in, 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 instill in me the beauty of that, you know? And, and this is to revisit something that was very important to the first book. This, this, is, this is our anchor. This is our, our, our guideline from the world of the cyberspace game that was introduced in the first book coming back to, 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 uh, to affect change in the second book. And that's the paragraph that yeah. we got to introduce the lights being turned back on. That's a, that's a momentous scene in a yeah. movie and it's a terrible repetitive run on sentence in this book. Yeah. I, you know, it's, I, it's such a shame that they didn't have the same translator for all three novels. Cause he comes back for the third one, as I understand. Yeah. Ken Liu does come back for the first. So, I, like, from what I've like been able to read on, on different, like, you know, just sort of trying to do my homework on these books. It's, it was just a scheduling issue. Yeah, that's why I was wondering if and it was. was booked. And and I, I do not, again, what Joel Martinson achieves is formidable. It, it mm -hmm. this, is, this is a deep, rich story. And I feel it, it at least carries the torch of what, of the concepts, of the science, of the practicality, of, mm -hmm. of the world and the sociology of the first book. I feel like there's just this one thin layer of heart that we couldn't quite grasp. Agreed, agreed, and it's it's just a, a shame. Well, and as, going back to it, uh, he, uh, I mentioned earlier how you had footnotes in, in Three Body Problem, cultural yeah. footnotes, which was, which I hadn't. That whenever you mentioned that during that podcast, it just I it hadn't even occurred to me because I since I did the audiobook, but like just I mean that's so nice that the translator would think of that. Oh, Ken, not, not only translating language, but also just like the culture. culture. Yeah. No, I, I have to absolutely gush, celebrate, adore all over Ken Liu. Because even in his own stories, every page has some type of handholding for Western audiences. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that there's sort of a philosophy in cultural identities that you shouldn't have to do that. It is such a huge olive branch and makes those stories so much more accessible. The way that Ken Liu almost creates mini documentaries in the background of the stories that he writes and of how he translated the three body problem that make these characters struggle so much more accessible. And when it's easier on every page to get a closer uh, idea, a closer feeling of what it is that they're dealing with or the historical context of certain political uh, political situations, things that we take for granted when we write from a Western perspective. Like I, I'm pretty well versed on European and North American history. You don't need to spell that stuff out for me. You don't need to show me Uncle Ben dying again for me to know where Spider Man comes from. <laughs> but, um, but if you're if you're talking about a a, a, a vastly more Eastern perspective. I am woefully undereducated on the that rich cultural history coming from that part of the world. So Ken Liu's work, which again, it it, it makes the book a denser read because every page uh -huh. then has like homework. <laughs> you, have yeah. to, you have to finish on every page, but you're 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 vastly rewarded for it. And and again, there was something that I felt like was keeping just some of the heart at bay. Uh, in uh, in Joel Martinson's work, well, and I, one thing that's that this story, as as you know, really tells me as as a Western reader for 
uh, viewing into kind of to the psyche of how you know how the, the origins of this book. It's interesting how it, it's very much the 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 society that would have to that deals with with the Trisolarian crisis very much is not the Western idea of of. Well, okay, so that, that's something which is I'm interesting. Glad, it's really, I'm, I'm it's really fascinating. I'm glad you brought that up because again, this is written. Oh. This is originally published in 2008, which means I would be very surprised if the core framework work of this book hadn't been considered in like 2004, 2006. You know, in yeah. him looking at where he wants to take a trilogy of books, and um, tell me, you didn't find it just a little bit amusing uh, that from a a slightly more communist perspective that he writes certain aspects of like South American culture to be overly influenced by Argentina and yes. how North America was, <laughs> was impotent in reining right. in politicians following wow. the more communist model for their people. And, and how in 2018, we kind of know that's not how that played out. Not yep. in a ha ha, because you know there are some really terrible things happening in South America right now, and I, I I hope the international community can find ways of making that situation better. Um, but in just the same way that we have a slightly more jingoistic sense of America always being the hero in mm -hmm. the end of the cavalry film, or in in Doctor Who, the UK is always the epicenter of every major alien conflict and the doctor likes mm -hmm. to land in Cardiff above, you know, yeah. landing anywhere else. <laughs> that, that loose season, um, which I've just butchered his name, uh, is, is doing the same thing for China. This, this is a mm -hmm. Chinese story. They are the, the heroes. Center of it. Mm -hmm. They are the epicenter of this conflict. And they're a part of the UN, um, establishment. They're a part of this UN Security Council. They're a part of this international coalition to try and solve the problem. But it is most decidedly from their perspective that we mm -hmm. see the greatest depth of heart, of character, and of uh, strategy manifest. Oh, absolutely. I will say the 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 <laughs> some of the other wall facers uh, were rather. <sighs> A little bit two dimensional, like Ray, Ray Diaz. I yeah. <laughs> it's terrible, but I had the I just imagined him as pretty much exactly as the as the the dictator from Monaco. With <laughs> <laughs> like, he just had the cigar, and everything. I just imagined him as, I mean, as the basically as the cartoon character of I mean, Mon from Monaco. Check your white privilege, but you're not wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the way they described him with his cigar and everything, and, and plus, also the way they depicted his voice as well in the audiobook was just perfect for it. Oh no! What did they do in the audiobook? Please oh, tell it me was, they didn't have some goofy accent. It was it was a very it was a goofy accent. Yes. Oh, no. I mean, there's especially a part of me that especially wants when he tried to beat that guy to death, it was very. Uh, whew. <laughs> I mean, there's a part of me that that maybe now wants to hear the audiobook. There's another yeah. part of me that really doesn't. Whew, That's yeah, hilarious. it was um, it was very so over the top. The other, the, w w we've got the four wall facers, and I, I mean, without getting too specific, this wall facer does this, that wall facer does that. I mean, if you if you couldn't glean from my last little, uh, you know, uh, gushing on this book. The, the wall facer from China is the one that has the most effective, longest farthest reaching strategy mm -hmm. um, because of the focus and the author and the, the, the people that this book was, uh, was written for. But the other three wall facers, um, I, did, did you feel like their plans were overly pedestrian? One wall facer wants to create a mosquito fleet of ships that, that could try and attack a vastly technologically superior force. Another wall facer just like, <laughs> Hey man, the best thing we ever made was the H bomb, so we should make a bigger H bomb. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's well, and what their plans end up being in the end too, just are kind of. I'd say the Ray Diaz's is the most grand of scale enough to a, approach it, but still kind of treasonous. Uh, <laughs> right. Just, 
<laughs> just a little bit of light treason. It's just a little light, light, treason. light treason. Yeah. Well, and, and okay. So I'm a little fuzzy. What was it? What was the end all plan for the the fighters? The fighters guy. The the, the guy who had the, the the all of the. It was basically Kamikaze. I think it was. It was his plan that he said for everyone else. I believe. Yeah. No. I mean, that's that kind of what it amounts to was just well, we can make a bunch, just tons and tons and tons of tiny little dis disposable fighters and then that's well there was it. something about like it betraying like turning on them or something like with i'm talking about with the way with, with the wall breaker oh, no, no, no. yeah yeah yeah. so, so, that, so that's yeah. what i'm a little bit fuzzy on with that yeah the the from what i understood is that it would have been sort of a defection that would have destroyed a significant amount of earth-based material and defenses to then supersede the relationship between the trisolarans landing on earth and then maybe using that to bridge either some sort of peace accord or to again try something oh. that was essentially suicidal and that his plan sort of hinged on this not very well explained notion of humans attacking humans for the betterment of humanity yeah like, I, we can't save all of us so we'll kill most of us and then some of us will still be okay um which then once that's sort of detailed and disclosed uh uh yeah he's basically sort of uh he's basically outed for yeah what would you know essentially a treasonous or an anti-human humanitarian uh, yeah, for you know, for for how convoluted his plan was, I was kind of glad he killed himself. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's a functional character, so I can you know. Well, oh. but, but that's that's to me is like maybe maybe one of the failings from the actual source material. Th this I don't believe is is the fault necessarily the fault of the translator. Um, I think there are some concepts like when we're trying to describe that, neither of us got a very good sense of how was this guy really betraying humanity. What what was what what was the conflict and i don't mm. feel like that was that was detailed as elegantly as it could have been um yeah. but i also think that that comes back to the original source the original the original writings here that if you make the other wall facers plans too simple the audience is already a step ahead of well that's a dumb idea why would you invest so much time money and effort into that that doesn't sound like right. it would it would ever work and the conceit is, well, the wall facers are keeping some part of their plan secret, so you'll never know exactly what their plan is. But then mm -hmm. two of the wall facers are essentially, their plan is totally on the surface. They share their plan with everybody, and their plans are terrible. One of them turns out to be like, yeah, that was my plan, but I was also planning on killing a whole bunch of humans too. And the yeah, other he's one like, I was like, planning on basically destroy humanity. Yeah. So it, they really felt just a little too two dimensional <laughs> mm -hmm. for for how the rest of the book plays out and the the third wall facer his plan doesn't even really materialize so much as he stumbles onto some interesting discoveries and that's where your favorite part of the book comes into play as the third wall facer <sighs> who isn't seal. looking at conventional military tactics it's not like we can just make bigger bombs or we can just make more ships uh, the third wall facer is trying to enhance human potential not mm -hmm. necessarily human intelligence but if we have an alien technology which is preventing us from improving in the world of physics what could we do if we could somehow enhance our our cognitive abilities and that's <laughs> where that's where you absolutely love it's your favorite part of the book it's like i yeah it's oh gosh it kind of you know, I, I, we were kind of going into it, and I'm I'm kind of digging his idea of you know maybe the I was thinking along the lines of well you know forcing evolution evolu you know speeding up evolution and whatnot, but no, just completely gets rid of free will. <laughs> like you could brainwash people completely. Like well, and the way that he described it too is so stark. Where it's like you thinking like uh, uh, what was it? they convinced accidentally convinced people that water was poison. It was toxic. Yeah. It was toxic. Yeah. And 
and well, it was. I love, I was like, I wait, love this what? part of the book. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna preface this. This to me was like that great Frankenstein moment. You know, it was like beware the technology you create. You don't understand what it is that you're working with. So mm-hmm. the the thing that I loved about it is like his plan is very loosely defined. We want to make humans better. We want to make them not right again, not necessarily smarter, but we want to make this brain function better. There, yeah. Um, so his his plan is what we could do is we could utilize supercomputer technologies to better or more perfectly map sections of the brain. And we could use that information to then create working models for how we can improve processing in our gray matter. And that can go hand in hand with technology. Maybe we'll have like cybernetic plugins, or maybe it'll be a biological solution, but we can make humans smarter. And then if we can make humans smarter over the next 200 years, then we'll have another 200 years to come up with new plans to face the trisolarans. And so he goes into hibernation for like 10 years. Mm-hmm. And that's when we run into sort of the both the Sophon limit in physics and the end of Moore's law. And for you know, anyone who's mm-hmm. into techie computery stuff, that's the 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 general guideline, the law um, that dictates sort of the uh, the increases in computing power from generation to generation to generation of computers. And and Moore's law, we keep we keep saying like, oh, we're going to run into the limits of Moore's law soon. We're we're coming to the end of physics and how small we can make computers. And then we cheat in some way, and then mm-hmm. we find a way to kind of extend Moore's law. But anyway, so he they eventually create this like football stadium sized billions of cpus computer (laughs) building pretty much to keep up with the real time real analysis moment to moment mapping of every neuron in your brain at like 30 times per second which i thought was kind of funny that that like no it was 24 24 24 times per second it can perfectly capture and map every single individual neuron in the human brain (sighs) Which again, I just thought was hilarious because obviously the human eye can't see more than 24 frames per second. So you don't need a G- an RTX 2080 Ti graphics card. It's, it's like computer. watching CCTV. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. It's just like we can turn this into a flip book. Um, so yeah. in, in creating this computer system, they start testing it. And this to me was probably the truest part of the whole book is that they set these um these like psychology tests in front of people and it's Mm -hmm. something really really basic if the statement is true push true if the statement is false push false and as they're testing one individual they go for a deeper scan on one of the statements than they usually do and that subtle bump in radiation in scanning this individual's brain while mapping every single neuron lands on the statement water is toxic To which he, of Uh course, replies, no. But because they were in that moment doing a deeper scan, it sizzles something in his brain, which Uh removes his ability to discern that statement from reality. So even though he knows in his in his, you know, he knows water is not toxic. That phrase has been burned into his brain. And now he can't unknow that. He is mm-hmm. now completely programmed to understand that, to take that as truth and to operate <sighs> as if water is toxic. And that's where we discover that that's where this this third wall facer discovers. If we have a problem with morale, <laughs> we have a problem with faith, uh, with religion or with defeatism in our in our military ranks. We could just burn it into their brains that humanity is going to win and we can just remove all of the doubt and all of the free will and and all of the problems and uh, we can have these perfect soldiers that are going to operate with clear and total understanding that humanity will win um it's like that didn't that it, it's not like it's not like that didn't work for certain countries during the second world war <laughs> you know <laughs> it's like <laughs> it, it, that's the whole thing i was thinking the whole time i'm like you know it still it's matters like, that botswana yeah, it's like there, there. It still matters that the Trisolarians are still beyond us in quantum mechanics, and 
Yeah, it, it's it's it was very interesting having that. That could have been a whole. That's why I think they should have focused on if they if they were going to have it in two separate books, they should have focused on that for the you know for the first. Well, I guess for book two, I guess two well, and a half or whatever. Yeah, for 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 Dark Forest two point five. Um, yeah, her, this yeah. is where this is where parts of the book really start leapfrogging, and and this is again in in exactly the same way that at five percent of this book i understood that this was going to be a different experience than the first one i'm still ready to walk this path with the author and with the translator but i was a little disappointed like oh i'm not going to get the same emotional connectivity it's at about halfway through the book that i realize oh all of this investment in the emotion of the characters, what what emotion we got for the characters, the backstory of these characters, the history and the future history of these individuals. Now we're just going to kind of chuck that and start bouncing through time. It starts at mm -hmm. a 10 year gap. Then there's a 50 year gap. Then we get to the 200 year time period. Mm -hmm. And it's functional. Again, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep coming back to that Agreed. from Joel Martinson. And what Joel Martinson has to work with, what he did with this, I think goes hand in hand it's functional but i don't think it's satisfying it, i don't think it's satisfying when you skip 200 years into the future and there's been ecological crisis there's been political crisis and you can kind of just brush that aside it's mentioned and it weighs on characters but it's kind of a yada 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 it doesn't it doesn't really matter to parts of the story, so you just kind of chuck it. And those are the parts of the three-body problem, the first book, that I felt were so compelling. The the world-building aspects of all of that I felt were were more valuable. And 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 I think Lou Cezin sort of deprives us of that. And then Joel Martinson's more practical approach to translation further removes us from the magic or the philosophy that I think would have helped imbue these moments as being bigger and grander and more important well and i you know as we're getting to this transition to the second half of the book this is where i feel like the translator really shot like his, the, his he was at his best in this book for me in the second half where it, when the book turns into the expanse <laughs> well but, but th doesn't that make yeah. sense though? because the first half of the book were, mm -hmm. is more emotion relationship and philosophy it's trying to say something but the second and half of the book runs with a more classic hard science fiction spaceships and laser battles rubber forehead prosthetics and klingon it <laughs> you have a more practical translator that more practical element shows through mm -hmm. but i like again i i am i am totally armchair quarterbacking this i'm i'm sort of totally backseat driving this but i really feel that a ken lu would have found the art of that future the 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 romance of that future mm -hmm. and why that tied back into the first half of this book that we invested in the magical storyteller, uh, the, the magical story of Lu Ji imagining a woman, which is then made flesh, which bears his son and is then taken away from him and is mm -hmm. through time, is, is moved through time for him to try and catch back up to her. You know, like yeah. there's something so romantic about, you know, humans as dried out leaves in the wind as a metaphor and art and <laughs> beauty. And, and I think the time leapfrogging would have landed better with that romance calling back to mm -hmm. the earlier aspects of, of the book. And that, that I feel like they did, they just didn't gel. I think that's why both of us feel like we kind of got two and a half books in one. It's right. It's, it's such a deliberate approach to each section of the story and each time period of the story. Mm -hmm. They don't, call back to each other and they don't really call forward so the beginning of the book doesn't really yeah, no. call to the future and the future doesn't really call back to the past and i feel like there's a notion of eastern philosophy in being complete like that right well of, and speak of, of finding the circle in your in your history <laughs> in your future 
Well, and speaking of that, the one I forgot. Uh, gosh, I've forgotten this character. He was the naval officer, Chinese naval officer that the, that we follow, and how they were they were constructing um, a battleship. The ta- or, or was it a battleship? Oh, you mean, uh, Beihai? Yeah, Beihai. Yeah, and how he they were constructing this ship that they were going to launch, and they ended up getting canceled, you know, because of space force and whatnot. And he eventually ends oh, up. In so, ca- so first of all, real quick. Did you cringe a little bit when they started talking about Space Force just with what's going on in our current politics? Yes. Current yep. Yep. Barinos. I, I, the entire time, all I was thinking just was that. So I, so, I, so I translated. I was like, Starfleet. Starfleet. <laughs> Starfleet. <laughs> yeah, because I'm just like, no, 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 no. I, I'm not going to be able to get through just hearing, <laughs> reading Space Force. Yeah. Okay, sorry. What you were no, saying. No. That was a terrible um, joke. Oh no, it was perfect. Well, like he, well, and uh, it, was, it was so fitting that he, you know, of course, he ends up commanding the the ship that they were wanting to build in the first place, and then he sacrificed and he murdered to be able to get to that future. And and it wasn't it fitting that it was because so uh, so what happens is the Trisolaran probe, they, the Trisolarans end up launching some probes because uh, and they are able to tell because they're able to see the the ships. Well, they don't see the ships themselves; they see the matter that they're flying through they're traveling through scattering and they analyze the pattern. Well, they, there are these probes that they sent that faster velocities to get to earth before the 400 years is up. And so we, uh, we get back to, we get the wall facers. Uh, well, I guess it's the, yeah, the Woji wakes up and the wall phasers are pretty much not taken seriously anymore. Well, and they, they have this fleet that they are, this society now is just convinced that they're going to just swat them, that they beat, beat the Trisolarans. They've become pretty complacent in their technology. Uh, and they, they have their fleet come basically go to meet up and meet up with this probe that they assume is going to deliver terms of surrender for some reason. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it just proceeds to, and it, it proceeds to, pr- with precision, destroy them within what? Well, how do they? De- I forgot how they described it. Like it was within like what twenty seconds? Like an entire oh, row. Yeah, of 10? I mean it's it, it's it's something that we've built for for hundreds of years to meet this opposing force, and it's 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 taken apart like like nothing. Like like we were gnats to an industrial mm-hmm. sized bug zapper. Right. And isn't it fitting? So three, four, was it like a, a, a smattering of ships end up going in some opposite directions out of the solar system? Cause basically they're just like, screw it. We're out. And, and isn't it fitting that, uh, what, what's that? Uh, the officer's name again that I've, uh, Beihai. Beihai. Uh, Zhang Beihai. It, right. Isn't it so fitting that the, cause this turns out, they needed to. They have to kill some some people just and take all of their supplies to be able to survive the trip. Yeah. To, so so yeah. it's two and ships, that, two ships with two crews, but between the two ships, they only really have there's several. Forces. It was more. Oh, it was four ships. Well, okay, so the, okay, so there were so there are two groups. There are two ships that went off in the one direction, and then a group of like four or five that were chasing Beihai going out the other side. Oh no! So, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, right, right. Yeah. And so there. So this drama is happening in. Both sides, basically. Both directions, you know. right? Yes, and Beihai's ship is—it's so fitting that it's called the Natural Selection. <laughs> you know, because eventually it gets him killed. Uh, like yeah. they—they're about to do this, and his moments of hesitation of taking out the other the other ship's crews so that they can save the rest of them gets him killed because they decide to do it first. Which is it just—it's insane. It's brutal. It makes me think of of those earlier times with the the what was it in the Battlestar Galactica miniseries? They have to leave all those people behind. Yeah, you know. Well, I mean, to me, it was it was little little hints of the dark side of the Dark Knight. You know, mm-hmm. there are the two fairies. You yes. gotta push the button. If they push the button before you, you can blow them up before they blow you up. Right. And you're like, okay, well, the movie obviously aspires to the to the higher you know notions of being a human on this planet um dark force doesn't nope not dark, at all dark force people get dead <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my gosh it's oh man it, it's brutal and, and and it's interesting too because i'm i'm interested to see if they pick up those threads is for because who knows how grand a scale that this is going to end up being because like I can't I'm I haven't looked 
yet uh you know at the at the it's death's end is the is the yeah. final book and i you know who knows they might even i bet you you know i'm calling it right now having not seen a single thing about that this third book that it is going to be thou it's going to span a thousand years this time okay maybe all right I, don't know. I, I, I could be. I'm most likely I, wrong, but I, I feel. I feel like th there, there's the, every potential for that, or even longer. At, at some point, it kind of becomes immaterial how how far apart the different. You know, like we could have a book that 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 spans to the heat death of the universe. You know. Yes. D considering what large leaps in in the cognitive storytelling and the cognitive fabric of the story that we take with this book, we we could extrapolate that out you know, to factors of a billion mm -hmm. <laughs> with another book because time travel is immaterial. You know, people can hibernate or different consciousnesses can be incorporated into particles which can traverse interstellar distances or, you know, mm -hmm. use different aspects of trisolarian technology to move us through space and time in very novel ways. Um, but but again, I, I, do, I do really appreciate, I mean, just to kind of wrap up our final like get in spoiler territory now in Lu Luo Ji's mm -hmm. uh, uh, storyline in, in a, in our time period, as he's, as he's unraveling these thoughts that the Trisolarans consider so dangerous, these axioms, this cosmic sociology, um, his position as a wall facer is, He's like the weakest of the four wall facers. He had the fewest uh, amount of resources. He had the smallest budgets and no one really took him seriously. The only reason why he was made a wall facer was because the Trisolarans actually tried to kill him. And this, he is the only person on the planet who the Trisolarans have actually tried to assassinate. And so um, what, what, we, what he comes to understand are, again, these general cosmological rules. And so following some of the technology of the first book where we can use star, our star, the sun, to amplify um, broadcasts, mm -hmm. to amplify signals, you kind of slingshot radio waves um, around our sun and that can boost. You can you may turn our solar system into a bigger antenna for sending out a signal. Um, he sends out a magic communication which would act as a spell against the trisolarans <laughs> and and like no one takes him seriously but he sends oh, yeah. it out into a far flung area of our galaxy which it was somewhere around 50 light years away so it's going to take 50 years for a signal to get there and then it's going to take another 50 years to see Pretty if anything correct. comes of that and that's where we end up 200 years in the future we discover that one of the solar systems that he flung this message out to was destroyed Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's very, it's very bleak. It's a very bleak take for describing, you know, how it's in, basically it's in, it's in each civilization's best interest to, if they come across a lesser advanced civilization, to snuff them out before they yeah. snuff you out. <laughs> Don't let them get big. <laughs> yeah, and so and and for me that I mean it, it was a very kind of bleak, I was like you know what after I read that I was like okay I need to. I read a little a, a chapter on that that towards the end, and I was like, okay, I need to watch an episode of Star Trek here to kind of get my <laughs> to get my faith <laughs> back in cooperation, you know. Prime director, because, prime director. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my gosh. So that's that's what I'm thinking like the whole time. But yeah, it's it's very interesting, and it's I mean, and, and they're not necessarily wrong because especially I'm interested to see what that civilization was that destroyed that system in the next if we see them in the next book because what if luoji still managed to screw over humanity well but again i that would i think there would be something really beautiful and this is why this is why i'm so excited to be getting to the third book even if we don't necessarily cover it right away on our show if we wait <laughs> a year before we cover it um but why i'm so excited to revisit this through the translation of ken lu uh ken lu is yeah i feel a move like Luo Ji, there has to be a balance for it. There, there mm -hmm. has to be um, consequences. The, 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 you know, he he conducted an experiment 
And that experiment resulted in the destruction, ostensibly the destruction of an intelligent, of a species on an, on an intelligent world. And I feel like you can't just, in, in this, in this universe, in this story, you can't just do that without some balance. Some yeah, well, some... well and did they determine first, do we know for sure that there was an intelligent species on that planet? No, we don't. Because, because it seemed to me like he just kind of sent it off to a random, to a well, random system. He, he does system. explain that that it, that that there were criteria, you know, for when he was looking at worlds which could have potentially supported life, worlds with mm. I mean, solar systems with certain types of planets in them and certain types of stars, and that it had to be far enough away. Like he didn't want to just send this right. message out to Tri Solaris because uh, that was too close. Yes, I, I need my magic spell to be further out, um, but that was by wall facer design he was sending out a signal that he was hoping someone else in our galaxy would pick up on right doing that he he's real lucky that there was like uh that the that the species that went to that system weren't like oh there's no one here well then we'll just go well but i mean it's like and also just you know cosmologically lucky that anyone yeah. who's listening <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh man it really goes to show how how misguided the original premise of that base was in the first book of oh oh the first the first uh nation state to come into contact with with another alien species will be at a huge advantage <laughs> right. you know and they, how completely misguided that was uh man well, i sure hope I also, I also think that there could be something there could also be something interesting about a, a, a truly alien intelligence. I think it's one of the things that Star Trek takes for granted and that the three body problem also has to abbreviate or cheat on a little bit mm. is an alien intelligence that we can come to an understanding with. And I think this is something that like the concept of the buggers from uh, um, Starship Troopers. No, 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 not Starship Troopers. Uh, um, Ender's Game. Oh, 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 it's a yeah. Space faring insect like um, hive mind uh, of, a, of, a, of a society. Um, mm. But they become technologically advanced in a very sort of ant drone, bee drone kind of way. We wouldn't be able to relate to something like mm. that. And so if another intelligence is incorporated into this chain, the, you know, whatever destroyed the, the, the solar system, the, the planet that we sent this message to, we have been able to communicate intelligently, uh, intelligibly with the Trisolarans. I think mm -hmm. it would be very interesting to see from an Eastern philosophy, what is it like when we cannot reach that other intelligence? And maybe it's an intelligence that's far more advanced than we are, and that it wouldn't even be out of malice or out of, you know, trying to acquire a finite resource or through some sort of pride or trophy hunting or something that we could understand. It could be an intelligence operating on a completely different level. It could be something dimensional, you know, like right. we just happen to exist in a gravity well that these beings are going to interact with for their own benefit. And we're particles and we're matter that are just in the way. And it's, it's nothing personal, you know, like, yeah, we, but we don't need to explain ourselves to tiny insignificant gnats. Here's our bug zapper. You know, like that to me, I think would be the, the next rung up. You know, you know the well, Trexalarans are a little more advanced than we are, but we were on the road to being just as advanced as the Trisolarans. What about an intelligence or what about a culture or society or an a, a truly alien intelligence that we cannot relate to at all? Well, and it makes me it makes me think of this quote from the book that it's very I think that held that held held was held in my thoughts was uh, yes a remote corner of the internet and in a remote corner of that remote corner was a remote corner yes which was remoted <laughs> and corner <laughs> well and it was uh, what business is it of yours if we destroy you <laughs> you know and then it's very apt you know and it was and it was very much I was you know we were thinking that during oh. when the fleet was destroyed but also just thinking about like what happened what if what species could could say that to the trisolarans yeah you know because it doesn't seem like the trisolarans have the ability to outright destroy a planet well destroy and us. and again I, I that's so. where I say they're 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 just close enough to us that 
we, we get to have that Star Trek cheat. We can have conversations through Sophons. You can have Trisolarans conspiring with oh, religious zealots, re religious zealot humans on Earth to affect change or to affect, uh, you know, policy. That's that's a sci fi cheat. You know, mm -hmm. that's. Yeah, that's convenient. It's yeah. Uh, it, sh it should be. I, I, gosh, I don't even know what direction they're gonna take take this next book because, like, it, I know they're gonna probably they're gonna probably focus a lot on on actual Trisolaran and human interaction. I'm really interested to see how that works uh, on in that sense because the what what uh, the Woji ends up doing. It, well, I don't want to give away the full the full. I, I, do you, what do you think? Okay, so I will say this this is the spoiler that won't completely wreck the end of the book, but Luoji creates an ultimatum that the Trisolarans have to respect at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And we're still far enough away from the Trisolarans arriving here that this gambit pays off. And so how all of that goes down, I think is still worth discovering and it's still worth reading. I think it's 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 actually a really wonderful way to kind of tie the tie up the end of his character's journey in this story. Um, but hope... it's it's we, we can spoil that far so that you okay. can make your next point. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that, that's I'm, I mean, I'm I will say I'm really interested to see if we have I really hope that they carry on the uh, the the rugged cop from the first from these from the first book who made the appearance in this book i really dashi. hope he's a, dashi i hope he, he's in the third book because he's the only character who's pretty much a constant in these books so the, which is one thing that threw me off too is we had to basically re re uh, acquaint ourselves and, and and get get to know new a whole new set of characters again which which kind yeah. of i was a little bit uh, about but uh, at least they well, got and, to have the one of the best characters from the first so, book. So I was I was glad to see Dashi, but he was vastly underutilized for being mm -hmm. as ridiculously entertaining, just phenomenally entertaining mm -hmm. as he was in the first book. And then for them to spend so much time celebrating the memory of um, what's her name, Wenji. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Wenji. Um, she she's she's this important matriarch of of a of a historical figure in the first book going through like 30 years of scientific exploration on earth and we mention her throughout the dark forest but it's really just in in passing in membranes in let's go visit her gravesite and wax philosophical about the nature of, well, of history and humanity and she's also at the, the very beginning too, because she's the person who tells yeah uh, 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 Luoji Luo. to go into cosmic sociology. So in a way, she kind of saves humanity too. After having doomed it, but after having but, doomed it, yes. I mean, just 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 listen to how you describe that though. Like again, a really balanced, nuanced. There's a ramification that wasn't explored in the first book that. She is the one who's responsible for attracting the Trisolarans to us. And she had such a tragic moment in her childhood that informed her decision to help an alien species potentially wipe out humanity. Mm -hmm. now that's that that was an interesting character dynamic. And that what you just described, I think, could have made for an interesting explored companion piece throughout the Dark Forest. But Agreed. it literally is. All, like three sentences in the beginning of this book mm -hmm. and then a part of a chapter at the end as we remember the three sentences spoken at the beginning of the book. Yeah, it's such you a waste check out this cosmic, this, this cosmic uh, sociology thing is basically like all, all she says. Yeah, and it's out of nowhere. For 470 pages. Yeah, it's it's such a missed opportunity, and 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 just and skipping out on all these a lot of those characters from the first book, and not like caring more over his main characters was really a missed opportunity, in my opinion. Yes, I completely yeah. agree. I, I feel like we could have abbreviated some of the exposition of oh god, yes, action. I, I feel we could have abbreviated some of the legwork 
to explaining character motivations, and, and especially with a character as rich as Dashi, who could have operated as more of a framework, as more of a structure. Mm -hmm. I, I really wanted Dashi to interact with all of the wall facers because right. the whole point of him in the first book is he's the bullshit detector. And right. If the wall facers couldn't even fool Dashi, then what good are they? And I really felt like that was going to be part of the dynamic. Like Luo Ji is, is totally abusing his position as a wall facer. He's building himself a beautiful home. He's using mm -hmm. all of these government resources to find himself the perfect wife. He's not really doing anything to try and save humanity, but he's living fat off of, right. off of the taxpayer's dollar. That would have been, to me, the interaction you have with a character like Dashi is for him to, to come in with that cutting remark that absolutely reduces him to, mm -hmm. to you know, a puddle of goo because it's what he was so good at in the first right first novel. and he was and he was just kind of a, like a, a almost like a garnish in this book right. well really. they used him to kind of help introduce the hibernation thing and this is something we were texting back and forth i kind of feel in this even in this story we've discovered an alien species we've been having conversations outside of our solar system we're working on like the pinnacle of technological exploration and we're being halted by a technology that is akin to magic i mean this interdimensional mm -hmm. particle folded upon itself so fun you know evil bug that can stop us from advancing <laughs> in physics even with all of these things i still feel that cryogenic hibernation would have been a bigger deal as a discovery. Like mm -hmm. it's totally just taken for granted. Oh yeah, we're just gonna hibernate you. Well, well, and they were, and it's not even just that. It's we already have this technology. Yeah, we could just do that. Yeah, we it's like, it, and, and I'm like, wait a minute. When did that happen? It's, yeah, like no, <laughs> it it was like it would have been nice if they had that. It would have been nice if they had like maybe tied that in. And, and of course, this is I bet you cryonics is kind of a like that fad was kind of. I don't know how much outside of the U.S. that fad was, because like I think probably, like if kind of kind of like wigging out about oh yeah I could freeze my head <laughs> yeah that's, that's, was, that's exactly what I was thinking too was like the head freezing and and it's just like they, if they had tied that in a little bit it just it just felt like a well, crutch I I just felt like a narrative what, crutch what, it felt like would, to me what would we have I feel like we actually would have gained something you know like humanity has discovered how to how to cryogenically freeze and revive someone like that. That's an amazing, that's an, an incredible mm -hmm. accomplishment. Like that's, that's magic right now. Well, and then there's no reason, no reason to not shoot out at least like a, a like a colony ship out for like, you can have your cake and eat it too. When it comes to escapism and right. defense, it would, especially by the time of what they got, like, you know, where they came up, they basically came up to around slightly ahead of slightly ahead of the expanse. I feel like. Yeah. They're slightly ahead of the expanse because they have particle weapons, totally. but, and like it, it, that part where it was where a little bit where that kind of, fell apart to where you know seeing what level of technology they were at they totally could have and should have done that without having the whole hodgepodge bowser galactica train through the accidental train through the stars thing you know so i don't know i will yeah. say the most the most enjoying part for enjoying enjoyment for me i got was that all of that where it kind of became the expanse <laughs> No, I the, the but again that's a, that reads as a completely different book. It, mm -hmm. it it's wholly and totally successful in its own segment. That doesn't feel like it belongs with the first half of the book that we start with. We we got a comment here from Ganzi Tech Nerd. Oh yeah. Or, or laugh out loud, wait, what about the dehydration of the Trisolarans made as a technology on her? Yeah, that oh so, my gosh. That would have been awesome because they live in such an unstable climate. Sometimes a star will be too close to their planet and it'll cook everything on the surface. Sometimes stars will be too far away and their, their, their planet will freeze. And this is why they're leaving their planet to come and use our planet instead is because our planet is super stable. So it would be mm -hmm. a much, much nicer place to live. Um, but one of the things that they describe in the first book, the Trisolaran hibernation 
which also is magic, is whenever things get really, really bad, they have this way of dehydrating themselves and then just being stored as husks. And they can yep. be revived at a future date. And you're like, again, there's there's an awesome corollary that humans have discovered a cryogenic freezing solution mm -hmm. to exist to, to, to moving through time. But we're not the Trisolarians. I feel like that would have been like a bigger deal in the story. And like, oh, yes, in between the first book that you read and this book, we've discovered this amazing ability to move you through time. You're going to be the first person, Dashi, to go and visit the future. And you're well, like, even that would have just given the moment a little bit more drama because, you know, like something could go wrong. We don't know if this is really foolproof. Will we ever see Dashi again? Right. And well, and also think of it this way too. They had had an escapist like Plan B ship go out. It would have been a beautiful, you know, juxtaposition of the the basically they're doing the same thing that the Trisolarans are doing, exactly the same thing. Totally. And and that would have been a great like uh, narrative parallel that they could have expanded on, and they really didn't that much. <laughs> but but also, so, I mean, I. I I do think that at some point we have arrived and I think this is probably about as good a place as any to sort of wrap up the discussion mm. of this book is that we've arrived at a book that's super broad is covering a tremendous amount of ground. And for all of our description about what's going on in here, the book's only like 400 pages long. So this yeah. is another really dense read um, mm -hmm. emotionally from a character standpoint in, 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 in the way that, Station Eleven, which we read a couple months back, manages to tell a more complete, more engaged, and more nuanced character story in 300 pages than Stephen King could tell with a similar story in The Stand with 1,300 pages. Mm -hmm. We kind of have the same problem here, too, where the book isn't hard to get through. It's not a long read. 400 pages is, you know, that could be a weekender for some of you. Um but it is really, really topic dense, relies on your relationship with the first book. And I think after a point, unless they had divided this up into two wholly complete separate novels, um, there's not anything else you could put in this book without making brains explode. <laughs> like it's it's already full. This book is full. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's just, yeah, it was just so, so full and so dense that they should have yeah, like because it kind of plays into my question, my answer with for Cheryl about uh, what he, what they what what's our opinions of the time dilation and progression in the series so far, and does it work for Western minds, sci-fi minds? And it's yeah, I think they 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 packed a little too much time progression in in this second book. So yeah, like as you said, two 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 parts of the story would have made it flow a lot nicer. And, and I feel like they could have related to each other in a more complete sense. Um, like I said, the, getting through the last quarter, the last third to a last quarter of this book to me was, was, was definitely a challenge because of how quickly I was flying through it. There, there's exciting rising action. There's science fiction combat. There's space explosions and battles. There, there are moments that are expansy and mm -hmm. Battlestar Galactica-y. Um, all of that's very, uh, like sci-fi fun that that's very entertaining but i don't know that i got to the end of this book with the same sort of wonderful sense of completion no yeah in the first book and i feel like a part of that is once we start leapfrogging time the parts of the story that matter the character investments that matter also get compressed and when you abbreviate that you're not left with the same heart you're not left with the same emotional core and so there are passages of three body problem that are grueling to get through it that, mm -hmm. i feel that book is a more challenging read it's a harder read but i think you're rewarded for that investment Agreed. better yes. by the time you get to the climactic showdown of that book versus this book where the climactic showdown doesn't feel quite as well earned no because you can't there well and you, it, it, the climax there are kind of two climactic moments in this like in this moment there's the climax of the earth plans like in there basically the 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 faith that 
the earth, defeat. The human, yeah, the defeat. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, and it, you knew that's what was going to happen. Like, like yeah. the, I mean, it was pretty predictable with that because if, and so, it it was quite interesting how they they managed to do it, and it, I I did just hope that we have at least one character from this previous book in the next one. <laughs> Well, so. and, and playing playing a more substantial role. I don't yes, want agreed. book three to start with three sentences from Luo Ji, and then we visit his gravesite for a page. And that's all that we'll have as an attachment to Dark Forest. Yeah. Like, I want yeah. Dashi. <laughs> yeah. I want no, to be focused on him. Well, yeah. I mean, just I, I want like a companion novel to this that's all just like. <laughs> Dashi solves a murder in Hong Kong and then flies to Spain and eats tapas. Like, just, just write that yeah. as a standalone story and let me just well, enjoy that. I will say right now, Dashi feels a lot to me like Miller in The Expanse. Totally. Yeah, like he's basically the same sort of noir character. So, Absolutely. yeah, that's so it's... That's what makes him so entertaining and so accessible. Yeah, so it's yeah. This book was was uh, was quite the doozy, and I'm I'm excited, you know, and I'm excited that we got to dive back into this into this yeah. universe, and and it's now after <laughs> reading this and yeah, having going so deep into this, our our next book should be pretty interesting and a little bit lighter of a read for our <laughs> for our audience. So so Andrew is taking pity on me because October is phone harvest season. So <laughs> let me tell you all about my experiences with the wonderful iPhone 10s. No, I'm not going to do that in this podcast. Um, <laughs> I have plenty of other podcasts where I'm going to, I'm going to cover that stuff and lots of other videos on YouTube, but because I'm going to be getting my ass handed to me, um, uh, we're, we're going to take something a little bit easier, a little bit lighter, and a little bit more, uh, it's more of a popcorn read for mm -hmm. uh, for the month well, of October. Andrew, do do tell us what book will we be reading? Yes, in the month so of we we will be reading Star Wars: Heir to the Empire, Woo! book one. Yes, part that this is from this by uh, by Timothy Zahn, and this is the the quintessential like what what people of our generation, I feel like, wished that Star Wars post Jedi and Return of the Jedi have become and yes. choose to believe is canon despite current things that are happening. It is Disney. canon. You can't yes. tell me it's not. Right. And it well is, it is what happened. Yes. And and it's been a, it's been a while since I've read this. And then we already covered a Star Trek novel. So we mm -hmm. figured doing a good Star Wars novel would be great. And and my absolute this this is novel series is kind of a, is close and dear to my heart because this book series introduces the character of Grand Admiral Thrawn. Mm -hmm. And he is in and, and my earliest some of my earliest memories of, of playing games on computers was TIE Fighter, where yes. they they were they released this book series and TIE Fighter around the same time and they both use Admiral Thrawn and TIE Fighter is kind of a pre equal to to all of this and so it so the the, the tie-in was great and he's and he is a gr fantastic villain for oh. it, it, with this and it, and it just overall the story is is just stellar and it's nice to have a future where luke is happy <laughs> i just I, like <laughs> not, not only that because everything that you just said i have to wholeheartedly concur with and just the the fact that you brought it up made me desperately want to go out and buy a new flight stick and get <laughs> a tie fighter again hey just, you just know so i could go through my tie defender missions oh heck yeah well you know as and uh, as i've told you that one training mission where you have to fight like just never ending uh, squadrons of, of a wings. Oh. And, like, the first time you face it, it's like the hardest thing ever. And then you get really good at your, your shield and weapon. And then the um, beam weapon. Cause then you can, yes. cause yeah, you, you just, okay. Flock them on with beam weapon fire missile. And, lead away, and then move on to the next one. Yeah. And, and, and like, so it's interesting too. Like the, that, those games were the best. Like, like if you like so wing good. commander and, and all those, like those, those are the first sci-fi flight sims that were more simmy and then how you can less arcadey and how you really, you controlled it. Well, there's um, it's actually funny. There are people who still play those now. And actually there's a next, there's a game called X-Wing versus TIE fighter, which is an, a more advanced version of it that added multiplayer. And there's people I know who have modded the game at all of TIE fighters campaigns so that you can play online oh, co-op. 
It's awesome. Oh, it is so cool. It's so great. So so I recommend you guys take it up and play it. Apparently these these people are also working on a standalone X Wing conversion. So X Wing not as good. Tie fighter no, is way better. Agreed. <laughs> oh yeah, agreed. Oh yeah. I mean, tie the like every part of that. The tie interceptor missions were fun. I never mm-hmm. liked the tie bomber. I liked the pla- the platform bombing missions, uh, uh, like the training mission on that one. I didn't like it, but then you get into tie advanced and you're just, it's so much fun. And then you get into the defender and you're like, this is the most amazing thing. Ever. Also best death Vader kill ever is in this game. When he kills Admiral Harkoff and the guy's like, ah, ah, and he's like, you know, like the, the best, the most satisfying Vader kill ever yeah, in this game. So yeah, but, it, this, but that's that's not the book we're gonna read. The book no, no, gonna... no, no, no. But uh, yeah, it's an also interesting thing of note too. So I I actually gifted you because I because I have Audible and yes. uh, and I, I gifted you a copy of the audiobook. Now if 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 this is one audiobook because I I've actually had this audiobook before. Um, this audiobook and a lot of the Star Wars audiobooks are very unique because they actually will have music and some sound effects with it. That are actually that accented and aren't like That's just cool. it becomes yeah, well, it becomes it, more of um it becomes more of a radio drama. Yes, it gr- it really does, and it, it actually adds to it. Though I was listening to some today because I started it again today, and and I definitely caught the the or- Star Trek the original series red alert sound, uh-huh. and I'm on the Star Destroyer, and I'm like, wh- wait, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hang on there. Yeah, but it, overall, it's 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 a it's actually a very good audiobook, and and that's this is one where I can wholeheartedly recommend it because so, the so experience this, this, is different. This is gonna be this is gonna be my legit first time. I'm gonna from soup to nuts, from beginning to end. I'm gonna do the audiobook instead of oh really? Book. Nice. So, I've got so many work events to tackle that mm-hmm. like. I'm going to be in my car. I need something to listen to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going to do the audio book. You know, it's, it's really good. Like it's, 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 that's, I think that's the one thing that you'll enjoy with this one is how, how much of a uh, performance, like I appreciate the performance and composition of it. Cause it's more than just the writing too. They're they're at, you're having to get the actual, they're conveying the emotions the, like and, and you know like you would from a film and a radio drama so it, it's very nice for that and it's very satisfying well and also i feel like there's there's sort of a grounding i feel like there's sort of a an accessible thread to star wars mm-hmm. where it's okay like i don't need to come up with all of my own magic and interpretation because they started out as movies right you know, we all have the same source inspiration to, to lead into it's not like my idea for what star wars music and sound effects and spaceship battles and characters should sound like because it's informed by a film so Mm -hmm. i don't i don't need to be so precious like again i I have a hard time especially hearing some of the samples of the audiobook from three body problem in tone in characterization in delivery (sighs) in pacing in performance everything about that audiobook feels wrong yeah, what was in my brain? I don't have the same concern over a Star Wars novel. Oh yeah, no. We're in much better hands here. Well, and they've mixed together all of the different John Williams scores for for Star Wars into enough cuts that they can get they can make it work for for oh, anything yeah. these days. So yeah, it's it's really nice. And and speaking of 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 Audible actually, and I just, and, and and I'm not like <laughs> sponsored by Audible or anything, um, but though we do have a link below. Um, yeah, we yeah. we do have an Audible <laughs> yeah. link. I mean, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. in part uh, sponsored by Audible. Right. Well, and one interesting. So and in, and I just actually I picked up uh an audiobook on there for for September. It actually was an audiobook and it's it's just really nifty. It's I didn't realize that they actually have courses that they they'll have like a lecture series on oh, there yeah, which yeah, yeah. yeah and we were talking about this earlier and i picked up the history of ancient egypt and it was it's a 48 part lecture series that's 24 hours long and it actually comes with a 172 page pdf course guide and it is surprise it was so surprisingly comprehensive and and i and you know that's one thing that i didn't even think about was having lec- was just fantastic his like lecture series on audible and and i recommend checking it out or even if they have some at your library i'm sure that actually that there are some available seek them out like it's it's really a fun way 
to to learn so yeah, yeah. that's that because that was that was going to be the other one is if you're into checking out if you're into checking out books from your local library i can wholeheartedly recommend the overdrive app mm -hmm. which will link Agreed. up your um uh, your library card with your local book repository uh taxpayer funded book repository system and help you um land ebooks and sometimes they're they have a section for audiobooks too right mm -hmm. yep yeah. yep so, they do so you can you can hook all that up there so if i mean while while we would definitely appreciate the support on this podcast mm -hmm. if you were to click on some of those links and do business with a mega corporation like amazon we also really want to point out there are resources for you to get literature that won't cost you anything more than the time it takes to get your library card. Right. And that maybe these are also institutions our culture and our society should be better supporting. Indeed. And plus also a lot of these institutions um, offer local and uh, community programs, community programs for, and also classes. So it's definitely, so again, them just in support. general, I feel like this is a, yes. a knowledge repository. Mm -hmm that is in the best interest of most communities to properly fund, support, and take advantage of. Indeed. If we're going to get crazy and political at the end of our life. <laughs> yes, they are, de they are incredibly important for us. And so it's, a, yeah, absolutely support your local libraries and local bookstores and local, as, as much as you can support literature support and the arts. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Support local. So I, I think that's that's the end of our podcast there. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined the live chat. Uh, Gansey yeah, Tech Nerd, who was uh, definitely commenting on some of some of the uh, the aspects of, of this novel. Sherelle Abdul Rahman. Uh, uh, Should you care? Uh, Laura Laura Fagan uh, runs a great little YouTube channel. Dropped by for a little while. A DTF. Yeah. J Lo. Um, some some great familiar faces in there that uh, I, I love getting to, to visit with you guys, not talking about smartphones and technology, but talking about some fun literature. So next uh, for for the month of October, technically next month's book, we might not be able to record next month's episode until <laughs> the beginning of November. Um, but the book for October is. Heir to the Empire. Yes, our introduction sure. to Admiral Thrawn, a Star Wars novel. Definitely go pick it up, buy it, check it out from your local library, acquire mm -hmm. it through some means uh, that we would appreciate that you stay legal. Um, and yes, we'll absolutely. Back next month on another episode of the Geek Book Club, you can catch me. Have those literature geek book comic book sci-fi book fantasy book kinds of conversations you can also reach out to us directly uh the geek book club across social media as well so you can catch all of those the rss feed the youtube videos everything you want to do for our monthly get together so we can talk about some fun reads for geeks and uh on that note i think uh we're gonna pop pop this over and uh we'll catch you next month on the geek book club catch you later guys